The Physiology of Meditation. Robert Ornstein discusses the physiology of meditation, its practices, and purposes. People have discovered a bunch of, a number of Eastern psychologies that are involved in training different faculties of the mind, faculties that aren't very well reducible to logic or reasonable thought. And when we had heard that people were learning how to meditate, we would normally take it in the sense of, oh yes, I'll meditate about that, in the sense of I will give it my best consideration and I will think about it. And that has led us to a lot of tremendous misunderstanding about what meditation, at least as it was or perhaps is practiced in some other countries, is about. People would think, well, um, it must be something mental in the, in the, in the sense of problem solving. And so a, a very distinguished writer named Arthur Kessler wrote a book about studying, in some sense, studying some aspects of yoga and Zen in which he finally concluded that it was just incomprehensible for him to understand what these strange people were doing because he couldn't figure out how they would help in, in directed, reasonable thought. But I think we have now seen that instead of being a variety of directed, reasonable thought, these techniques are in fact intended to dismantle that faculty, to perhaps to suppress it for a time so that other aspects of knowing can come out. It's done simply, I think, and easily. There's been a lot of junk written about all different forms of meditation, and it's been written both in terms of people who will dismiss the whole thing as being trivial and useless, and after all, how can thinking of nothing give help to me, or how can I say that anything that isn't for the mind in the, in the more restricted left hemisphere sense is something that I can't possibly make use of. That's one way that we've dismissed it. The other way has been people who say, far out, here it is, the sacred mantra of the age, and I've paid my $35, or I've gone to this, this place in India and to get it. So if we can steer clear of those two areas, we can perhaps get an idea of what is there. And what is there is a very simple and very practical technique. Whether one needs to do it or not is not, I think, the question that I'm involved in answering, but what the technique is about is very simple. All the systems that practice meditation, be they things which use a word as a focus, that is, in India it's called a mantra, in, in other countries it's called other things. If they use a sound as a focus, if they use a visual object such as a sacred symbol like the cross or other objects like the crystal as a focus, they all involve something that is not a logical process but a physiological and psychological process of the restriction of attention to one unchanging source of stimulation. And all the instructions that one finds and reads about meditation come down to this. That is, one is always in instructed to just look at whatever it is, think about whatever it is, listen to whatever it is for a period of time and nothing else. And so what it consists of is an attempt to produce a certain state in the nervous system which consists of, in essence, a non-response to the external environment. There are several experiments that were done over the last 10 years, partly at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, some at the California Institute of Technology, on a very similar process. It was not done for any of the same reasons. These investigators were looking at a particular theory, which was originated by the Canadian psychologist Donald Hebb, which postulates that we need continuously varied input to sustain normal consciousness, that our normal awareness of the world is dependent on getting a lot of changes that come in, so that our eyes, for instance, if you note, are constantly in motion. Even when we're fixed on something, there's a small eye tremor, which we normally don't notice, which is called optical nystagmus, which in effect tends to refresh the image on the retina continuously by by moving it around over, say, a few cells at a time. Now, Hebb wanted to find out what would happen if that process was interrupted. So he developed a system by which contact lenses were put on people's eyes, and a little projector was mounted on the contact lens. Now, that sounds a little difficult, especially when one blinks or something, but one's eyes were 
taped at the time, and that can be maintained for a few moments. So when we normally look around the world, we normally see a tremendously varied changing input each time we move our eyes. In this special situation, every time the people moved their eyes, they found that they saw the same thing. So each time a movement would occur, nothing would change in the world. And what happened was the object started to disappear. That is, that once the input was very radically restricted to one unchanging source of stimulation, it disappeared and people began not only to not see anything, but they also reported that they weren't seeing. That is, it's as if the mechanism that produces vision had just decided to turn itself off. And the same thing happened with research done about at the same time on a technique known as a Gansfeld, which is a homogeneous visual field which is obtained in many ways. One way is by putting halved ping pong balls over the eye, the other is by putting the person in a, in a totally featureless white room. And once people were in this, and people who one finds at, say, the Arctic or poles where there is just a tremendous absence of that normal richness of visual input, once people were in this situation, again, not only would they say that they didn't see anything, but that they just didn't have vision anymore. And at a time during the, the Gonsfeld experiment, the colors were switched on the ping pong balls and in the room, and people just didn't even notice it because they, what they had done was that they had turned off to the external world and turned off that normal mode of consciousness which is so directed outwards and so much, and of course of necessity, for our biological survival. The subjects in the experiment had no idea that anything like this was going to happen. So the reports are very inconclusive. I think the important thing is that no matter what these people's expectations, the major and common effect occurred, which is a loss of response to the external world. Now, the interpretation of that would be very different, say, in a monk in rural India in the 12th century, as opposed to a freshman in a psychology experiment in Canada who is just going to be there for half an hour. But there's no doubt that the exercises of meditation have, have stemmed out of some experiential knowledge of the way in which our nervous system works and they in fact constitute a method of changing its operation so that certain functions turn off and perhaps others turn on and one can point to this physiologically as well as in terms of the communalities and experience. The way that people who quote study these more ancient mystical systems is to try to separate themselves out from the normal flow of everyday life. Now, in one sense, this can be a help at some times. In the other sense, it can get perverted into a withdrawal from, from life and all its activities. But it does c constitute an attempt to try, at least for, at its best, to try, at least for a period of time, to turn off that normal mode of consciousness. And so, in order to do that, one often tries to be free of the, the stimuli which compel one most of the time, people's voices, telephones ringing, things to work on. And so one withdraws often into a cave or into a place on the mountaintop in order to have some free space in order to do this. Now, this can again get quickly perverted into thinking that living on the mountaintop or living in the cave is what one should be doing at, at the expense of taking the benefits of perhaps this kind of exercise and then coming back to the world. In most of the Indian and Japanese techniques, breathing is used, not so much in the sense of being controlled, but the breath is something which one has with one all the time. It's nothing that one needs any special bit of apparatus. And so people as a first Zen exercise or in yoga are often asked to simply concentrate on the process of breathing. Often, similarly, a word is given for people to repeat over and over again. Now most of the time there's, again, a lot of this mystical nonsense about the word that's being given, and some of it may be useful in the cognitive dissonance sense. That is, if I give you something and tell you it's terribly important and it's the only word that you should ever repeat over and over again, then you're probably likely to do it. But again, it gets perverted into people saying that they have the right word and somebody else has the wrong word. And you know, One could tell a few stories about that. And 
we find that a mantra in India and in Japan and in other cultures is used again and again. One finds it in the Eskimos, one finds it in the Bushmen. And again, it's simple, it requires nothing. It just requires someone saying something over and over and over again. And again, in this kind of technique, the word used is often something very, very mellifluous and very easy to repeat so that it just keeps going again and again and again. And it doesn't really matter, I think, at this level of analysis. In Japan, too, and especially in Zen, there's a, a technique that's attained a lot of notoriety because it involves asking people unanswerable questions. Um, it's called a koan, and often it's given as a a first Zen exercise where a student will come to his master, especially in the past, and he will say, you know, one of these silly questions like, show me your face before your father and mother met, or a contemporary one is, how can I attain enlightenment while driving on the freeway? That's given out by one of the Los Angeles Zen masters. And D.T. Suzuki wrote about his experience with the first koan that's often given, which is, what is the meaning of mu? which is a word that doesn't mean anything in Japanese. And he was, like most of us, a very scholarly, very intellectual man who thought that meditation had to do with directed thought. So he went to his Zen master and was given this koan, and he went out and went to the library, looked up the word, looked up the meaning of it in various cultures, looked up how it had been used, and prepared a paper, and brought it back to the Zen master, who ripped it up and threw it at him and said, get out and... Uh, come back tomorrow and solve it. So he went out the next day and then he tried associatively thinking about it and thinking about the word and how sound could affect consciousness and all these interesting mystical thoughts and came back and delivered himself of a long discourse and the master threw him out again. The third day he came back with yet another explanation and finally the Zen master picked up his sword and said, look, if you don't solve this problem by tomorrow, I'm going to kill you. And Suzuki was just totally shaken and totally struck by the experience and walked out having nothing to say and just thought about it, just thought about the word. And again, he made it his consciousness instead of going on and on in the normal verbal intellectual manner at which we generally like to take problems like what is the sound of one hand clapping or whatever you decide. He focused on it and of course he then came back having solved it. But if you ask what the answer was, you already get into the trap. I am really not aware of anyone who is um, involved in Western psychology in its traditional sense who really is able to study sound in the manner that it needs to be done. I think at the level that most of uh, us four psychologists are, we have to say it's an interesting possibility and it's difficult for us to tell what is what in this at the moment. And we have to, I think, proceed from the level that, that we can proceed. Certainly, a lot of people in other cultures do hold that different words and different sounds have very different specific effects on consciousness. Especially words, I think, more, as far as I can say, more, I think, in the sense of the sound, in the sense of the effect that they have more directly on the nervous system and more specifically, I think, on the part of us that's very sensitive to sound, which is that nonverbal right hemisphere side of the brain. We tend to try to understand everything logically and rationally, if we can possibly do it. That is, in almost all people, the special province of half of their brain, half of their mind, if you like, which is the left hemisphere. The left hemisphere of the brain is involved in language and reason and logic and is primarily responsible for words and a sequential way of ordering things in the world. The right hemisphere is much more involved in music, in sound, in movement, the tonal aspect of, of say, words and music and is a way of understanding things, if you like, more directly, but I think that is a little, a little unfair in terms of the physiology. That's a word that's been used much more in mystical writings, that is, that one can understand directly as opposed to indirectly. I would rather say that if the left hemisphere and its logic and word 
orientation is a sequential way of understanding things. That is, things have to be worked out in logical form in order for it to be acceptable. The right hemisphere is a much more simultaneous mode of information processing, so that everything sort of comes in at once, more like a stew than an eight-course dinner. Specifically, most of the meditation exercises that I've read about, and uh, my work has been, I think, much more anthropological than anything else in this, the specific instructions again and again are not to think, not to say anything to oneself, not to talk, not to plan, not to think about the future or the past, not to worry about anything. These are all products of that rational and logical part of ourselves. And when they say, this is not for your mind, I think what they are meaning is this is not for your rational side. This is not for the part of you that, that you think may be your mind and that Western culture may think may be all your mind. What they're saying, it is not a bird machine. And one has to turn off that side in order to let the other side come forth in the sense that since we since that side of us is so hypertrophied that it just goes on and on and on doing doing its work, going about its business, planning us for the future, worrying about the past, getting us through the day. Since we are so locked into that system, one needs at some points, at least under some supervision, to prepare some kind of way of at least temporarily getting out of that so that other aspects of the world can be seen. It's a little bit like the idea the, the best idea that I have thought of in terms of meditation is to compare it to the, process, the, the difference between walking around during the daytime and walking around at night. When we are in the midst of the daytime with all its brilliance and all the competing forms of activity, it's very difficult for us to perceive very subtle sources of stimulation which are present all around. So if one were to go out and look for a certain constellation at noontime, even one that one had read about that was reported in, in very respectable journals, it would be ridiculous to try and find it. And so many of us in the West have tried just to do that. We've gone out at noon and given it some, what we think was a fair chance. We've gone out at noon, looked up and said, nothing, I don't see anything. There doesn't seem to be anything here. These guys must be cranks or goofs or something. And uh, we'll then go back to our laboratory and say, sorry, we've looked for it as well as we could. But noontime isn't the only state of the day, just as our normal outward orientation isn't the only state that we can have. So as noontime changes to midnight, those subtle forces can be more and more perceptible to people. There is a Middle Eastern joke figure named Mullah Nasruddin, who was one day walking around in the marketplace at some bright point of the day looking for something he had lost. And he was clamoring around under the marketplace, turning up things, and a friend of his came by and said, have you lost something, Nasruddin? And he said, yes. And he said, uh, I lost my key. And he said, well, um, can I help you? And he looked around for it all around this, this marketplace in this well-lit area. And finally, they simply couldn't find it at all. And the man said, well, can, if you can give me an idea of where you might have put it, I might be able to help you a little more. And Esterton said, sure, it's in my house. And the man said, what? Um, why are you looking out here? And he said, well, there's more light here than inside my house. And again, there is a lot of brilliance outside. And we tend to get lost in it when in fact there may be some very important things that go on inside which may in fact be the key to a whole realm of other activities but groping around in the dark inside one's house isn't very elegant one may bump into something for instance but it's important to note that what we are looking for outside may simply not be there that however inelegant it may seem the key to a whole host of activities which have been considered beyond the norm in the West may lie inside, in, a, in the dark area, if you like, of the mind, in an area that is not brilliant, in an area that is much more quiescent and, if you like, in which all things happen simultaneously. 
something that we haven't quite understood. And this is what, at least at its best, and at certain times, meditation is intended to provoke, whether it's something that one ought to just go out and do in the next eight minutes is another question. But I think it's important that there is something of tremendous lasting import here, that we have, I think, for once and for all, found that the restrictions of that very low idea of who we are within Western education is really finally, for once and for all, broken. The question will be then what will come of it and what areas will mature and advance and whether it will lead to some more permanent amount of understanding of who we are and who each of us is and how these things can work. There is an interesting convergence of evidence here between early research on the brain state of meditators and the research which I mentioned earlier on the stabilized image and the Gonsfeld. In both situations, you recall, there is a very consistent attempt made to keep awareness restricted to one unchanging source of stimulation. In both, people report and Many people in meditation report that the external world no longer exists, that I can move into a state of darkness or the void, as it's called in yoga, or emptiness in Zen or no mind. And in both situations, there seems to be an increase in a certain brain rhythm, which is called the alpha rhythm. During the moments where the people in the stabilized images experiment reported that they weren't seeing anything, they were asked to press a button so it could mark a mark the trace on the record and they found that that at the moments when the external world disappeared there tended to be much more alpha rhythm in the brain also some early studies done by uh, neuropsychiatrists in Japan and psychologists in India have shown that many meditation exercises are associated with an increase in the alpha rhythm of the brain so it seems that there is some physiological basis to a lot of these mystical words and techniques that we have not quite been able to understand, that, they, that they're not to be understood logically or rationally, but as merely a means of cultivating a certain mode of operation of the nervous system, which, at least during the exercise, is a non-response to the external world. Now, the people who do research in transcendental meditation, which is the technique popularized by the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, have done a lot of studies of other physiological variations that occur in people who take up meditation. And they found that it decreases many of the internal processes which are associated with stress, that blood pressure goes down, that heart rate goes down, that lactic acid in the body goes down during meditation. And they think that in the kind of culture in which we live, in which we are subjected to extraordinary environmental stresses, that the practice of meditation may be a way for people daily to rid themselves of the extraordinarily harmful and increasingly harmful effects of the environment. Now, it's not terribly well-documented research yet, although the article in Scientific American I thought was quite good, because One simply doesn't know how much any particular technique contributes and how much simply putting someone in a quiet room for, say, half an hour a day away from more of the stresses and strains of life could do just as much. But certainly doing that, even if it's just getting away and doing that, could be very helpful. Thirdly, on a less uh, physiological level, many practitioners of it report what's what they call a sort of a freshness of vision after they meditate for a period of time. And this has been studied more by observation of people than than by putting electrodes on. But one does seem to find that people say that they see things freshly and newly after this process. And in this, I think it can be best compared to taking a vacation. That is, this turning off process is like getting away from the normal habitual routines in which our mind runs simply because of the stresses and the dominance of our verbal intellect. Simply turning that off often enables one to come back to a situation and see it differently in the same way that if you went to Mallorca for two weeks and came back to, to London 
you might look at the painting in your apartment and say, oh, look how interesting that is, and not having not noticed it for the three months before you went away or notice the furniture in your house, notice what your friends are saying to you again. So it's a, a normal process of what we call in psychology dishabituation. That is, as we normally go about the world, we mostly tend to try to turn it off as much as we can. That there's just too much coming in for us to make any reasonable sense out of. So, for instance, if you note yourself at the moment, you've been breathing all this time, but you're not really aware of the flow of air that's coming through your nostrils until I call your attention to it. And again, in three minutes, that will go away. And if that doesn't go away, the weight of, say, your body against the ground will not be part of your consciousness until I call your attention to it. There's some mechanism that tells us in our nervous system that that's not interesting, that it's not important. And it's called habituation in psychology. And If I present a clock ticking to you in about 20 seconds, you will not hear it anymore in a, in a room. Now, the clock hasn't stopped ticking, but your consciousness or your mind has decided that that's not important. And if you've ever been in a room when you where a clock was ticking and it suddenly stopped, all of a sudden something happens. And what you're hearing is the absence of a repeating stimulation which you had decided wasn't interesting. There was a study on people in Zen while they went through a similar process. Now again, in Zen, one is it is said that one sees things for the 500th time in the same way that one saw it for the first time. Now, divorced of its, its sort of mumble and jumble, we can say that what they're talking about is that, that meditation is a process of dishabituation, that meditation allows one to look at things less conditioned by past sets than, than one would if one wasn't able to do this. So they took people in this experiment and put them in a room where a click was sounded every 15 seconds for several minutes. Now, if, if I took you or I into, the, into a room like that and recorded from the brain, the first time the click sounds, there would be a tremendous interruption in the brain wave, change in heart rate, change in galvanic skin resistance. It's what's called in by Russian physiologists the orienting reaction to something. If I go like that, you you move your eyes or something happens and there's a shock that we feel. Now, if I keep doing that again and again, what happens is you begin to get used to it, even if I keep doing the same thing over and over again. And what happens after about six of them is that if you look at the traces on the EEG and GSR and on the heart rate, you find no change. Just as when a, a ticking clock is going on in your room, you begin not to hear it after a while. It's as if it wasn't there, just like your breathing isn't there, and just like your weight isn't there. But the Zen masters who were recorded in this didn't screen it out. That every time the click sounded, this, the very same physiological reaction would occur again and again and again, no matter how many times it occurred. Now, that's an extreme example of it, and it's not clear whether it's useful all the time to hear everything that came in. Because if you try to be conscious of everything that was happening to you all the time, you probably couldn't get across the street without getting killed. So we have to be able to focus very precisely on what we do. But we've done that, I think, a little too much in this culture to the point that we are unable to let go of it even when we can. And that's the virtue, say, of a monastery or a meditation exercise. That is the the original idea of a monastery would, would be that it's a sort of safe place where you don't have to cope, and you don't have to cross the street, and you don't have to do your work so that one can let go of that mode of dealing with the world so that something else can come in, and then one can return. Again, there's the problem of people just going and staying in a monastery for 30 years, which is probably not much better off than had they never left where they were. There are a lot of Chinese techniques which involve it. One of them is a dance, which is an almost dance, which is called Tai Chi Chuan, which again, one is intended to focus one's awareness on just this flow of movement and nothing else. 
and again it combines a lot of more direct right hemisphere activities and this process of focusing in the Japanese martial arts especially this the same kind of one pointedness or stillness of mind is sought but again it's translated a little more into direct activity such as shooting an arrow or breaking a brick with one's hand and again the activity is almost always impossible but it's brought about by the very act of concentration on one thing to the exclusion of other things it's not magical it's just a matter of turning off the sequential way of doing things and opening up a more simultaneous mode in which different faculties can occur and can happen these are not paranormal it's just that our idea of what's normal has been a little duly restricted i get a fair number of letters from people who will write and who have been involved in one technique or another and say i'm involved in things i simply can't handle now and what should i do and there is some danger in it and it's it's very much downplayed largely because the people who are involved in a lot of the the systems these sort of technique centered systems of meditation don't know what they've got and so when someone comes in and says i can't control myself anymore i can't i can't undo what's happened they really don't have any technique for it they've been just taught a few things to say but if it's not if it's just for a quick amount of amusement or some experiential idea of it it wouldn't be very difficult to simply find a quiet place and as quiet as possible and just sit for 10 minutes with eyes closed and try to just attend to the process of the breath now i wouldn't recommend anybody doing this very much but just as a quick idea of what these things are like it might be of some interest i don't think that anyone especially anyone who does something like a tape could possibly be in the business of recommending a technique whereby everyone could do something although that's the biggest problem with many of the systems of meditation which are now in now around where they say this one thing is good for everybody at all times come and learn our stuff and we will teach you how to attain the 16th level of nirvana in 3 and a half hours and $47 please or whatever uh one really can't do that there are no magical roots you can try a little bit by just sitting and and doing that and perhaps opening the idea that that it might be useful every day to take a period and simply sit and relax as some some preparation and that may be a lot of the benefit that it may be a 10 minute break away from everything once or twice a day without doing anything fancy or anything that you don't really understand may be a great help that is in the middle of a business day it may be good to just close one's eyes and and do that people do this it's just that we somehow think we're cheating when we do it that it's not right that we ought to be working and uh, we don't realize that we may by pushing ourselves too hard not not be able to work as well as we could or really not do what we ought to be doing so some time like that is very useful whether one should have a genuine indian word that's given to one by a uh, famous yogi or not is uh, is not something i think that's very necessary